When you focus on the breath, there are quite a few activities going on in the mind. But the two most important in getting you to be with the breath and stay with the breath are directed thought and evaluation. Directed thought is when you keep reminding yourself to keep coming back to the breath. Breath, breath, this is what you're going to be thinking about. And evaluation is where you develop your discernment. You start out with simple things like, does the breath feel comfortable? Where does it feel comfortable? And if it doesn't feel comfortable, what can you do to change? Do you change the rhythm of the breathing, the depth, the heaviness of the breath? Do you change your concept of the breath if you're feeling that you have to pull the breath in through some tiny nasal passages that are feeling a little blocked? There's going to be a lot of pushing and pulling. How about thinking about the body as being the huge sponge with holes all over? The breath can come in, go out from any direction with no obstruction at all. What does that do? And with the various breath instructions, you have to figure out which ones work for you. And John Lee has you survey the body first and then settle down to one spot. And then when that spot is comfortable, think of the breath again spreading through the whole body. And some people find that works. Other people find they have to do it in a different order. You find the one spot first and you stay there for quite a while. And he takes that into consideration. One of his Dharma talks, he says some people have to start out with just one little corner, like a person with a huge piece of land where you want to start an orchard. And you can't plant all the trees throughout the whole orchard all at once, and so you have just one little corner where you plant your trees, and you look after those. Make sure those get established, and then you very gradually take the seeds from those first trees and you use them to plant the rest of the orchard, bit by bit by bit. Other people find that the breath doesn't really get uncomfortable until you are fully aware of the whole body all at once. If you focus on one spot or another spot, you tend to tense up around that spot. So in that case, you think whole body, whole body. Think of the breath coming in and out through the whole body, and then gradually you can settle down into one spot without putting too much pressure on it. So here again, you're using your powers of evaluation to figure out what works for you. And it's always an issue of just right. What's just right for you? This is why the middleness of the middle way is primarily a function of your discernment. You start out by evaluating what works for you and what doesn't work. When something's too much, when something's too little. Sometimes we hear about the middle way being halfway between pleasure and pain, but that's not the case. Sometimes you have to practice with pain. Either it's forced on you and the body's not feeling well, you've got a really bad emotion coming through the mind. You have to work with that. Other times you find when you're living very comfortably, you start getting lazy. So you have to be willing to push yourself some more. So there are times when painful practice is useful. Contemplation of the different parts of the body. Say when you've got a heavy problem with lust or a heavy problem with identifying with your body. The Buddha counts that as a painful practice because it's not nearly as pleasant as just sitting here and being comfortable with the breath. So you have to figure out when it's wise to ex practice a little bit more pain, or a fair amount of more pain, and when you need some pleasure to keep you going. Now the pleasure here can be the pleasure of concentration, but if there is no pleasure in concentration, then you have to be very careful about your physical pleasures. One of the things that always fascinates me about the Pali Canon is the fact that it's got wilderness poetry. And it's ascribed to Mahakasapa, of all people, who was probably the sternest of the Buddhist students. 
You know, he has a long poem attributed to him, talking about the beauties of wild nature. Now, this was unusual back in those times. After human society started settling down and being agrarian, people tended to view nature as a very negative thing. The, the phrase howling wilderness is something that you hear over and over again. And it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution that people began to think that wilderness was actually a beautiful place, something worth preserving, rather than something you had to be tamed or run away from. Yet you read in the Pali Canon, people like Mahagasapa talking about the beauties of nature, wild cataracts, water flowing over granite mountains. All the animals of the jungle, the trees and the forests, plants in the jungle. But again, it's a sensory pleasure used in the purpose of finding the right atmosphere where the mind can settle down. It's the same with that contemplation we have about food, clothing, and shelter every day. It doesn't tell you how much or how little to eat. But it keeps reminding you your purpose in using these pleasant things, and how much pleasure you're going to look for them from them. Try to get rid of feelings of hunger, but don't replace them with feelings of being overstuffed. And always it's the purpose. Why are you using clothing? Why are you using food? Why shelter? Why the medicine? To give you an idea of when you can tell when you're going too far in your use of these things, using too much or getting too carried away with finding just the right this or just the right that. In other words, this is how you approach issues of pleasure and pain with discernment. You look at how you can use these things as tools. It's your purpose in using them. That makes all the difference. Do you pursue pain? as a good in and of itself, or pleasure as a good in and of itself, then you're off the path. But you don't regard them as evils in and of themselves either. They're tools. And you want to learn how to use them for the right purpose. That's where the discernment comes in, reminding you that they are tools and also trying to appreciate the, the principle of moderation and actually master it. So these are all areas where you exercise your powers of evaluation so they can become powers of discernment. Figuring out what works for you, what's just right for you. There's a lot of stuff that's there in the canon, there in the teachings of the Ajans, but it's abstract. Principles, ideas, pointers. But you exercise your own discernment each time you breathe in, each time you breathe out. Figuring out where to place your attention, how long the breath is going to be, how deep it's going to be. And all the other elements in the meditation that require balance. Whether this is a time to stay with one spot, whether it works better to expand your awareness or to go through the body section by section. All of these are areas where you have to use your own discernment, exercise your own discernment. It's in the details of these things that your discernment gets sharpened. It's only through exercising your powers of discernment, your powers of evaluation, that you get a sense of when you can trust them. So don't be too quick to rush through the details or rush through the little steps. Because of the discernment is in the details. 